Tiffany and you One and one together make two And all the stories that are true Tiffany and you You're listening to Tiffany and You, the podcast. This is your host, Tiffany Yu. On this episode, I'm joined by Alex Locust, who is a disability justice champion and serves on the selection committee for Diversability's inaugural D30 Disability Impact List, a list that will be honoring 30 disability leaders globally who are making a difference in their communities. July 26th marks the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA. It's a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life. It's modeled after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the ADA is one of the most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation. Before the ADA, there was Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the first disability civil rights law to be enacted in the United States. I highly recommend watching the documentary Crip Camp on Netflix to learn more about that story. July has officially been designated as Disability Pride Month in San Francisco in honor of this anniversary. Alex and I chatted about that and ahead of announcing the D30 honorees, We are also giving you a behind the scenes look at how this process came about. Hope you enjoy this special episode and our conversation. Hi everyone, you're listening to this episode of Tiffany and You. This is your host, Tiffany You. This is a special D30 impact list edition. And I have with me one of our selection committee members, Alex Locust. Hey, Alex. Hey, Tiffany. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Alex is a counselor slash coordinator, currently working at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. In addition to that, Alex is a community organizer, workshop facilitator, who has organized a lot of workshops around disability justice around the country. So I always like starting with origin stories. Have you met Rosemarie Garland Thompson? I have a a few times, but don't know her super personally. So I, I have also met her a couple times and she said, Tiffany, it is so important for us to share these origin stories because it really highlights the diversity within the disability community. So I wanted to start by asking you about your disability origin story, however you interpret that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's so much power in our stories. I mean, you know me, I kind of like to add a little humor, a little zing for everything. And so I've been joking lately that just my left leg never clocked in. <laughs> I was born this way. There's not a lot of shock or excitement to how kind of normal it felt as a child because that's how my body is and, and was. I, I haven't really invested a lot in the, the science of it, understanding what medical terms would uh, describe it appropriately. Just that's how it was. And I later in life at 13, went through amputation in order to pursue more streamlined prosthetics. So I can uh, formally call myself an amputee. I thought it was pretty funny. I encountered someone once who corrected me. I said I was born this way and they were like, well, can you really be called an amputee? (laughs) Um, Mm. But really, I think it's just, it's something where this is my body and I've just been learning to love it and adapt with it since then. Thank you for sharing. We had Dr. Victor Pineda, another Bay Area based disability advocate who told me that he had two origin stories. The one was his first understanding of disability, but So I'm curious if along your own journey, was there another turning point to where you really saw and took ownership of a disability identity? Yeah, I love that idea because for me, my disability identity is so intertwined with my queerness. There are queer disabled elders who I really learned to view disability as a queering of the body. Queerness also involves many coming outs. 
there's kind of not one, you don't just get to come out one time and be done. And so I think that along that idea of multiple origin stories to what I mentioned earlier around being born this way, I think as a child, I, I feel like I was more comfortable with my disability than other people were. I was really happy hopping everywhere. I really didn't take to wearing my prosthetic very often. I was, I was just a, a little little pogo stick. <laughs> and enduring the trauma of an amputation at 13, really in a way that looking back, I'm troubled by how that process went about. I really want to trust the best intentions of the doctors and professionals. And of course, my parents who've been unconditional support all my life. I also think to undergo such a traumatic surgery, even if it's something that someone wants to go through for the the surgical reasons, it's still a lot for a 13-year-old. And I think at that time, I didn't have the, the consciousness around disability, ableism, justice, to really make a sound decision there. And so what I believe happened was I, I kind of almost regressed in terms of disability pride. I, I became really shameful and insecure about my body. It was as if the the medical profession had said something's wrong with your body and we have to fix it and prior to that moment I hadn't felt like anything was wrong and Mm. so I would say that the second coming out or another wave of that was really the liberation of getting crutches and moving away from feeling like I needed a prosthetic to be whole if I never had that leg having that added to my body always felt other and it always felt foreign and so I kind of was always itching to get it off at the end of the day and I think that wasn't just about the physical sensation, but the emotional experience. So this new era that I'm in now, thanks to the Bay Area, thanks to learning about disability civil rights, learning about disability justice, it's really not just an ease of moving away from agendas other people have set for my body, but now I have the language and the framework to hang my experiences onto and a pride outside of my individual self, but really like a lineage to move into. There are movements, there's history. It's not just me grappling with these things. I can aspire and set my intentions to be in alignment with people who have really paved the way for the life that I'm living now and the life that I want to create for disabled people that come after. That's beautiful. If someone asked me the other day, they said, what advice would you give to younger people with disabilities who may be lacking self-confidence or self-esteem? And for me, it was rooting yourself in community And I think for you, being at the intersection of disability and queerness and being able to have elders that you could turn to sounds like it was really powerful. So I said community and role models and being able to have both of those and see yourself reflected back for me as well allowed me to take ownership and pride within my own identities. I know we are living in a COVID era, but are there any projects that you're working on now that you're particularly excited about? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I think in the spirit of disability justice and speaking to sustainability, I would say I'm the the biggest project that I'm most excited about. Disability justice is so much about anti-capitalism and and identifying our worth outside of who we are as working beings and, and what we contribute. And I think this pandemic, this sheltering in place, this physical distancing and isolation has been a screeching halt to the really unsustainable pace that I was going. Um, I, I work a full-time job as, as a counselor. I, I was doing facilitations once, twice, sometimes three times a week, traveling, really enjoying and relishing the opportunity to flip the script and be in the driver's seat of conversations around disability and ableism rather than always being expected to do unpaid emotional labor and being really excited to see people excited about these conversations and elevating their access and inclusion and being a a megaphone for disabled voices that I'm really excited and and inspired by and building that sense of being a public figure that I can eventually create more opportunities for disabled people and use that money to donate and, and pay back. But with all of that, I wasn't resting. I wasn't cooking for myself, haven't made space for counseling and healing and taking care of the everyday things, taking care of my space. The the project I'm most excited about is my own care, my own wellness. And 
really prioritizing those things so that I can be intentional about what I say yes to so that I don't just do everything in the hopes that it's like a, a critical mass kind of situation. It's really about working smarter, not harder. So I think the only tangible thing outside of my own self-reflection and, and, and journey is I've been doing my workshop that I, I'm really proud of. I call Spill the Disability. So I mentioned my corny humor earlier. And I had, at the beginning started a Sip and Saturdays. So like a taste of what disability looks like and um, doing Instagram live conversations with people in other movements and finding ways that we can explore cross-movement solidarity as a disability justice principle. I got to do one with a dear friend and, and peer, uh, Kali, and we talked about a sex kink and disability. I have some other ones that I've lined up that I'm excited about. I just, I, I put a pause on that. We just moved, right? So I, I really wanted to focus on those kind of things so that when I do come to the conversation, I'm bringing my whole self, I'm ready to do that, and I'm modeling what I say. So those might happen on my Instagram again soon. I'm looking forward to having more of those conversations. For sure. I love what you said about leading by example and this real focus on care. That's a big part of being able to show up in this work is all of the internal work that that we need to do before we can even show up to serve our community as well. Um, So we're going to take a quick break here, but when we back, we're going to chat all about Diversibility's D30 Disability Impact List. Even though this is a presidential election, there are many more candidates on the ballot besides the president. Go to Ballot Ready for a nonpartisan guide to your entire ballot. From there, you can compare candidates based on stances on issues, biography, or endorsements, and then save your choices to use when you vote by mail or in the voting booth. You can even request your absentee ballot or make a plan to vote early or on election day. This election matters. Make sure you have a plan to vote and vote informed. This year with changes to polling places and vote by mail laws as a result of COVID, it's more important than ever to have a plan to vote. 30% of voters take the time to vote and then leave some part of their ballot blank. This is a missed opportunity to choose the leaders of our communities. And it's okay if you're unfamiliar with some of the more local positions, We recommend hosting a ballot party, get together with friends over Zoom, split up the research, and go through your ballots together. Go to BallotReady.org and enter your address to make a plan to vote and vote informed. And we're back from the break here. I have with me Alex Locust, also known as Glamputee across social media and on his website. Hey, Alex. Hey. (laughs) So before the break, we were chatting about origin stories. And then we were chatting about some of the things that Alex had been working on and is now shifting into what it looks like in a COVID era. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Alex's Spill the Disability workshop was one of the recipients of our Awesome Foundation grants back in the day. And I also want to acknowledge I've just learned so much from him around disability justice, around internalized ableism, around microaggressions in the disability space. So uh, a lot of gratitude for Alex is all I have to say. But that said, this is a special edition. Diversibility decided that amidst this pandemic and recession, and as all of us know, the disability community has really been disproportionately impacted by everything that's happening right now. And our team was really thinking through this year's the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Huge milestone. We'd love to commemorate it. We also want to balance acknowledging all of the hard things that all of us are going through, but can we do something to celebrate? And so we came up with this idea for a D30 disability impact list, recognizing disability leaders. And so I ended up just texting Alex. I think it was probably like 10 p.m. on a Wednesday or Thursday. And I said, hey, would you be interested in being on the selection committee for this disability list that we're putting together? And he was like, yeah, sure. So at that point, we hadn't put together any wording or any idea of what it was going to be like. I'd love to know what made you say yes. 
I'm looking back at our text and I'm just like, you know, it's not just a yeah, sure. I know for sure with me to, to reciprocate that gratitude, Tiffany, I think you, you demonstrate the power and vulnerability. And I think that your story is just so out there as a part of everything that you do. And I think that that kind of leadership is so refreshing to see you to lead and with wholeness. You're not shying away from the messy parts, the imperfect parts, the painful parts as equally as important as your triumphs and your successes. When Tiffany, you says hop, I say how high. <laughs> and so I think that's why I said yes, because not just that you were the one asking me and that I, I trust your vision and your principles and, and what you bring together, especially around intersectionality, around celebrating disabled people of color, you know, disabled women of color, queerness, all of these different margins within that. But the fun part about the ADA is that it was signed days after I was born. <laughs> so mm. I, I have this funny relationship with this like piece of paper in that I'm days older than it. And it's kind of almost a way of si saying I, I have been alive for the amount of time that this has been in practice and what's been accomplished since then. Of course, I didn't know what disability rights looked like when I was, <laughs> you know, just born. I, I can also relate to how difficult and slow progress can be when we lead with just relying on legislation to do cultural work and seeing how in those 30 years, for as much as there's been instrumental change and for as much as disability justice leadership has helped to challenge and elevate what the ADA started, there's still so much to do. And so I'm deeply grateful for the celebratory stance that you're taking, where you're saying like, rather than wait for us to be celebrated, let's celebrate each other. I love the centering of disability as in that you selected such a diverse panel of disabled people to be doing the selection process. So that way it's for and by, which is part of why I love events like Superfest from the Longmore Institute so much. You brought up role models earlier, and I just, I really love um, Laverne Cox has talked about the idea of possibility models, kind of revolutionizing that concept and saying like, I'm not aspiring to be this person exactly, like have their life and they're on a pedestal. It's more that that person represents a possibility of people like myself and, and where we can go in life. And I think this D30 offers an opportunity to really elevate the stories of more disabled possibility models for everyone to see how people can create cultural change in their lives and their communities using disability as a generative force in that process. Mm, beautiful possibility models. So I am looking back at our text exchange. The original text said, diversity projects, would you be interested in joining the selection committee for a disability list of impact leaders? And we will announce <laughs> on rings for ADA 30. And then you actually, it will it was a yes, please. I'd love to be a part of that. So fast forward a couple weeks, we ended up getting almost 400 nominations. And Tiffany, that was one of my favorite parts about this process is just learning about so many different efforts and programs and initiatives and communities that are actively uh, working to or have been working to just lift up disabled voices. That's one of the beauties, I think, of social media, of this digital age. It's really easy for people to, to slam millennials and to trash <laughs> social media. It's the downfall of us all. And I think there's space to have conversation around that. But one of the, the joys that I find is that sometimes I'm like, I can't keep up. <laughs> That's like kind of a nice problem um, to be developing is that there's not just one thing, if you ask somebody like that, that's the only platform, I think that usually is a, a sign that we don't have enough is that it's really easy to name the one thing. I think this effort that you've organized is certainly one of the most robust explorations of a global celebration of disability and disability leadership. Um, I think in my experience doing organizing or, or facilitating workshops, I'm usually very intentional to name that I'm presenting from a, a U.S.-based perspective because that's what I know and I want to uh, model that cultural humility of like there's so much out there and when you get to global conversations around disability things start to become really complex when you 
think about how the moral model can come in sometimes. And I have not seen something of, of this scale before. So this was really exciting to be a part of. I love what you said about like, I can't keep up. And I feel grateful that I had such an incredible selection committee that I didn't need to be involved with it. And I do have to give a shout out to Katie Brennan from the diversity team for really leading the charge and being really organized. There is a lot that happened in the background that the selection committee didn't see in order to get everything prepared for all of you. And then I have to give everyone on the selection committee a shout out because we received way more nominations than I was ready for. And I was nervous. I was nervous that we would be able to get it done, but we did. Full disclosure, we're in the process where we are finalizing our list so we don't actually know what it's going to look like yet. Alex, I'm curious, were there any surprises as you went through the, the D30 nominations or the whole process in general? Yeah, uh, before I get to that, I also want to give a shout out to Katie. Such appreciation and gratitude for that amount of organization. And I think there's a real beauty in the finesse of, of a warm reminder and, and some healthy follow-ups. But, you know, I know I was, I was a little behind on some of this, but <laughs> Thanks to Katie for, for making all this happen. In terms of surprises or the process itself, I also just uh, on the, the tip of the shout outs, been in conversation with a really good friend, Nakia, who we were talking about celebrating excellence in the Black community recently and how it's really important to not fall into the trap of capitalist or ageist or ableist notions within celebrating that Blackness. It's really easy to just focus on people getting certain white standards of success. So just focusing on Black people getting higher education degrees or, or really big scholarships or making it into the business realm in, in certain ways. And so and that really provided a healthy adjustment to my lens when reviewing these things of like, it's so easy to think of success as like, what's the biggest, what has the most impact, what earned the most money, who has the most followers. Um, so reviewing these, some of the surprises were some of the grassroots efforts that disabled people are accomplishing all across the world and thinking it, it's very hard to compare people with these different lived experiences and contexts on a equal playing field. I think you really set up the, the process well to have some specific questions around not just is their nomination representing disability success, period, but with the added context of where they're at and what privileges or barriers that they're experiencing, how does that impact their efforts and, and what they're putting forward? So. I think it was just really nice to look at that and, and say, well, grassroots efforts, maybe impacting a few uh, people might not be the biggest global effort, but at the same time, given what their community might be facing, given that country's history with disability, given the, the physical access that those people might have to accomplish their goals, I think those were things that, that were really important for me to remember as a disabled person, trying to model, again, what I'm saying and celebrate success of all different kinds. Mm, I love that. One thing that resonated with me is really changing definitions around success. Now I just look at myself and I'm like, I like myself. And that yeah. is actually the biggest, that's the biggest success of all. Yes. What a radical, um, you know. Exactly. And then the other thing you said, I'm very passionate about disability employment Unemployment numbers have been hovering around 70% still, uh, even with the passage of the ADA. And I often tell people, if one disabled person gets a job who historically has been unemployed or underemployed, that's yeah. a success for our community. And I love that framing as well. Yeah. So all of that said, our plan is to announce a couple days as a member of the selection committee, having seen a lot of the nominations, is there a message that you would like D30 
nominees to hear, the ones who aren't ultimately selected? And then is there a message that you want the honorees, the ones who get selected as the final 30 to hear as well? Yeah, you've mentioned the importance of community several times and that really resonates with me. And so I would say to anyone who is nominated that this is a community that you're a part of now, you know, and I think that that alone speaks to the success that those people have had in impacting people in their lives to to be nominated. They've obviously touched someone, they've impacted someone or or someone's, right, people to earn that effort to have their experience lifted up. And I think that that, that unequivocally is something to hold with pride. And so if in the, the way that things uh, are selected, that a nominee is not chosen um, as one of the final honorees. I think just remembering that that impact is unconditional that you've already made. And I know for me, just reading all of these stories, seeing all of these different things that you mentioned, Tiffany, right? Like all around the globe, so many different disabilities, so many intersections of identities. Like my heart swelled reading these and realizing how much people are just triumphant and how much disability creates so much beauty in the human spirit and so much resilience and strength and power. And I think that they are already possibility models for people in their lives and people like myself witnessing that. And so to the people who do get selected, I just say like own that, really take that fire and and burn brightly, share your message even louder with more people, the authenticity that you're demonstrating has shown through the internet, has made people who haven't had the the pleasure and privilege of meeting you yet excited about what you're doing and excited to really name that for other people to be connected with. And so connect with each other, create community with each other, really like share those ideas. Tiffany, I love our friendship because I think it's a model of disabled people coming together and, and making each other's ideas better. I think that there's a lot of pride to be had all around and I'm, I'm really grateful to have been a part of this process. I guess my message would be, you don't need a list to tell you that you matter. Yes. And if you are on the list, I just have to echo what Alex said to shine brighter. And I'm watching a show on Netflix right now. And there is a scene in there where the main character named Peyton and his mom are both running for office in different cities. Mm -hmm. And he goes to his mom and he says, mom, I need you to stop running. And she goes, don't ask me to dim my light. You need to shine yours brighter. I love that (laughs) scene because we all have light. So many of us within the disability community have either grown up with a scarcity mindset or a feeling of lack and Mm. the transition to sitting in a place of abundance is really around knowing that all of us have lights that we can shine brighter. I I love that you're bringing in abundance. It's been such a a pivotal shift for me. You know, you bringing in shine, like uh, I love Call Your Girlfriend, the podcast and the way that they've really articulated what shine theory means of by helping others shine, it doesn't take away from yours. It, it really just refines how you see success in other people and, and can teach you things about yourself. And I think, like you said, with disability, not just scarcity in resources in the world, but also like because we don't have many possibility models or have it in the past, I think it can be easy to, to get in a competition of like, well, I have to be the person or I have to be the resource. And, and creating infighting among each other. And so having that cross-disability solidarity, again, yeah. pulling from disability justice, it's about lifting while you climb, which I guess isn't always isn't necessarily the most disability-friendly metaphor, which I should look at, look at myself about that. But we have opportunities all the time to help support each other and it doesn't take away um, from us. So, so I really appreciate you bringing that in. Of course. Speaking about disability pride, so I'm not sure if you saw the news, but... On July 14th, oh, I, sure I want to say if I have the day right. <laughs> yeah. San Francisco Mayor London Breed signed a proclamation designating July 2020 as Disability Pride Month in honor of the 30th anniversary of the ADA. It's nothing super groundbreaking. I just felt like it was a huge win for our community and a huge win for our city. 
And so I wanted to close by asking you, what makes you disabled and proud? Yeah, well, I mean, let's just take a second to just celebrate you, Tiffany. I'm so proud of you that I saw that news and I just was beaming to have the the pleasure of knowing you. And I think it that is an example of what we're talking about in the context of this whole process. It's not about minimizing success or having disabled success conditional upon um, fixing entire systemic issues by yourself. The success that you you achieved in getting that proclamation is inherently really amazing. And the beauty of that is that we don't know what change that will cause. Having that Disability Pride Month explicitly named could touch someone a month from now, a year from now, who could be the person who, because you're demonstrating that pride and that authenticity in your disabled identity, might have them be in a place where they can work on the housing issue or financial inequities for disabled people. So I think for me, that leads to my pride in in disability and that disability, as I already mentioned, is a generative force. It's, it's magic. It really teaches me to be more thoughtful and, and aware of myself and my body, my body mind in community. And as Alice Wong has put so beautifully, disabled people are oracles. And I think in a time where, especially during a pandemic, that a lot of people are facing really intense and painful reflections of their body minds, disabled people have really laid groundwork for entering into the space and understanding that our lives aren't over, that having challenges around access and ability don't mean that our lives are inherently lower quality, right? It, it just means an opportunity to revolutionize and to radicalize. And I'm just so proud to be a queer disabled person of color as a part of the disability justice movement because of that. Mm, beautiful. We just bring such deep, immense expertise into all of these things. If people want to find you online or hire you for a workshop or continue making disability justice magic, how do they find you? Yes, yes. I would love for people to be in touch. Thank you for this opportunity to promote, Tiffany. Uh, I'm GlamPT on all things, probably. So G-L-A-M-P-U-T-E-E. Let's make some magic. I've been saying I like to bring my five C's, right? Crutches, claws, curls, compassion, and courage. So let's see what we can make happen together with disability at the forefront. I can't wait. Oh my gosh, I love those five C's. So I do want to give a quick shout out to the other D30 selection committee members who couldn't join the podcast. So we have Aman Tape Sachamuni Wong, also known as Sanju in Thailand. Then we had Aman Shakur who is based in Saudi Arabia, Aaron Brown from the Bahamas, Joe Vasquez, also from San Francisco, Lonnie, also in the Bay Area, and Tatiana Lee from Los Angeles. So our dream team of seven D30 selection committee members, along with Alex Locust, are what made all of this happen. So thank you, Alex, for being on the show. And I'm excited to see this list go live. Yes, I can't wait to see the final list. I feel like this is like the hum of the anticipation. It's, it's very exciting. Thanks, Alex, for being on the show. Thank you, Tiffany. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tiffany and You. This is your host, Tiffany Yu. If you enjoyed this conversation, please leave us a rating and write us a review over at Apple Podcasts. It allows these conversations and these episodes to be discovered by other podcast listeners. I'm hoping that we can co-create something here that's valuable for you. So to the extent that you have feedback or other topics you'd like us to explore, don't hesitate to reach out. You can find us at tiffanyu.com slash podcast. And a special shout out to Root Hub for our opening and closing podcast medleys. We release episodes weekly, so I hope that you'll join us next week for the next episode. Tiffany and you This one is done and another coming soon A special rendezvous For Tiffany and you